Hi everyone, I'm Wei-Shen, a PhD student at the Australian National University, and welcome to another Mount Stromlo Astronomy Talk. Today I'll be talking about star clusters and what's the big deal about them. But before I start, I must mention why I decided to do this talk in the first place. So this was in 2017. A group of friends and I had a camp or retreat at the Green Hills Conference Centre, which is actually relatively close to Mount Stromlo. It was a very charming and relaxing place with an amazing access to nature. So during one of the nights, some of us decided to go out to stargaze, and as that place has pretty dark skies with not much light pollution. I decided, decided to let them observe some interesting astronomical objects by using a green laser pointer to guide them to the object while they looked at it through a pair of binoculars. One of the objects I showed them was a star cluster such as this one. To many of us who have observed star clusters before, it's a spectacular sight seeing these distinct beautiful balls of stars through a telescope or a binoculars. Unfortunately, not all my friends were appreciative of the beauty of star clusters, and the most memorable quote of the night came from one of them, who said in a very unimpressed tone, but it's just a cluster of stars. Very disappointing. So that is the motivation for today's talk, to tell you what's the big deal or what's interesting about star clusters. Here's the talk outline. I'll be covering what star clusters are, including the early history of studying and observing this object. I will also talk about the two main types of star clusters, plus their usage in astronomical research. And finally, I'll go through some common star clusters observed in the southern sky, with the hope that you may find some time to go out during the night to observe them using a telescope or even a small pair of binoculars. Just a reminder, as I'm talking, feel free to leave questions down below in the comments. Sorry. <laughs> so what are star clusters? The most ba basic definition is that they are groups of stars that are gravitationally bound. This means that stars in a cluster all orbit around a common center of mass, similar to our solar system. Since virtually all clusters have been discovered either by visual examination of the sky with a telescope or from inspection of photographic or electronic images, an operational definition for star clusters is suggested over here, which is an obvious concentration of several stars or more above the surrounding stellar background and identifiable on the visual or infrared images. Now, since star clusters are just groups of stars that are bound to each other, are double stars or triple stars considered star clusters then? The answer is no. So what is the minimum number of stars to be considered a star cluster? This is still quite unclear, but some astronomers have defined it in terms of its total mass, which is 10 solar masses. That means if all the stars are approximated to be of similar mass to the Sun, the minimum number of stars in a star cluster is 10. The history of studying and observing star clusters go all the way back to the second century as the first star cluster was catalogued by the Roman astronomer Ptolemy in 150 AD. That cluster was Omega Centauri. However, if you notice, it was named as if it was a star in the constellation Centaurus. This is because to the unaided eye, it appears to be just a bright point of light without any extended feature. The image on the left shows what Omega Centauri is like when observed through a powerful telescope but the image on the right shows what it's like when it's seen using just your naked eye. Now, as you can see, there are many stars shown in this picture. So in an astronomy edition of Where's Wally, can you tell which one is Omega Centauri? I'll give you five seconds to try to find it. Okay, so it's actually right here, circled in red. You would agree that it's really hard to distinguish a star from a star cluster, right? Hence, you can't really fault the early astronomers for misident misidentifying these objects. Later in the talk, I'll teach you an easy way to find Omega Centauri in the night sky. Like many first-generation scientific instruments, early telescopes weren't of too high a quality and lacked the capability to resolve star clusters easily. Mind you, telescopes were invented in the early 17th century, so even through them, star clusters looked like fuzzy clouds of light, similar to what's shown in the figures below. Therefore, in the early days of telescopic astronomy, star clusters were often referred to as nebulae or clouds. In 1764, Charles Messier, the same guy who created the Messier catalogue of deep sky objects, was the first person to observe individual stars in a globular cluster. You might notice that this is the first time I'm using the term 
globular cluster. I'll go through more about this later, but all you need to know now is that, is that it's just a type of star cluster. So over several centuries, astronomers have studied star clusters in great detail, and we have pieced together a pretty good idea of how these clusters have formed. Clusters are formed when very large clouds of gas and dust, also known as giant molecular clouds, contract to form stars. You might be wondering why the entire cloud can't just contract to form one single massive star. But the chances of this happening is very unlikely, since every giant molecular cloud contains many localized dense clumps of gas and dust. It is because of this reason that astronomers believe that most stars are formed as part of clusters. Our sun was also thought to be part of a cluster, but sadly it has since dispersed shortly after the sun was born. As an illustration, the pictures below show the remains of giant molecular clouds in which the young stars shown were formed. So I'm now going to talk about the two different types of star clusters. The first one is open clusters. These are loosely distributed clusters which contain around 10 to 100 stars. And they are relatively young, about a few million years old, which is young in astronomical terms. Open clusters tend to be found within the disk of the galaxy, as shown over here. As such, they are mostly found along the same plane in the sky. On the other hand, you have globular clusters. These are tightly bound clusters, which is what you would call a ball of stars. They normally contain around tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of stars, which more than open clusters. And they are relatively old, at least a few billion years old. They tend to be found all over the galaxy in a halo of bulge as shown in this diagram. The sun's location is also shown here for reference. Of course, star clusters are not just pretty balls of stars in the universe. In terms of its age in astronomical research, they are useful specimens as they can allow us to trace the star formation history and galactic evolution over time. One of the main tools used to do this is the color magnitude diagram. So what is this diagram about? Now, I must ask those who are allergic to graphs and plots to turn away as I'm going to talk about them in the next few slides. The color magnitude, magnitude diagram, or CMD for short, is a plot of observational data which shows how stars in a star cluster can be described in terms of their brightness in the y-axis and color in the x-axis. In the CMD example shown on the right, each dot represents a star. When all the stars are plotted together in one diagram, you get this shape over here. Different parts of the diagram represent different stages of life for the star. For instance, you have stars in the main sequence, which is a relatively early stage in a star's lifetime, found in this region over here. But as you move up, you will get stars in the red giant branch, which is a much later stage in a star's lifetime. Now, the next thing you can do is to determine the overall characteristics of a particular star cluster. The light blue line that is fitted to the star cluster is actually a model, which allows us to determine useful information such as the ion abundance, age, and distance to the cluster. And finally, with proper calibrations, the CMB can be converted to a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, such as the one shown on the left, to determine the luminosity and temperature of the stars. In this diagram, the more luminous stars are at the top, while the hotter stars are on the left. So as you can see, star clusters can be used to measure a variety of useful properties that will help understand the nature of the universe better. So getting the technical aspect of studying star clusters out of the way, let's move on to something more fun, which is observing star clusters themselves. Today, I'll be introducing three famous clusters that you can observe in Australia. The first common star cluster is Pleiades, which is also the inspiration for the Subaru logo. Even though it's actually a northern star cluster, you can still observe it in Australia in summer. This beautiful open cluster is sometimes referred to as the Seven Sisters, as this is because usually only seven prominent members can be seen with the naked eye. In total, there are more than 100 members in Pleiades. You might be wondering why there is a cloud-like feature surrounding this cluster. This is caused by what we call a reflection nebula, but the actual scientific term should be a scattering nebula, as the dust scatters the light from the stars to form this bluish cloud. This is also the same reason why the sky is blue. So here's how to find Pleiades. Starting from the Orion's belt, follow where it points until you reach Aldebaran, an orange star in the constellation Taurus, which you can't miss. Then, Pleiades will be found further down in the same general direction. 
The second common star cluster I would like to introduce you is the jewel box cluster. Early astronomers thought that it resembled a box of jewels, which is why it is named as such. Just like Pleiades, this is also an open cluster with about 100 members inside. What makes this cluster very pleasing to the eye is the contrast of colour caused by the red supergiant star surrounded by many blue dwarf stars. So where is the jewel box cluster found? This is pretty easy. Starting from the Southern Cross, also known as Crux, head slightly southwest from the left star of the cross, which is Mimosa, and you should be able to spot the jewel box cluster. And last but not least, the final star cluster I'd like to introduce you is none other than Omega Centauri, which is the largest globular cluster in the Milky Way. Estimated to contain about 10 million stars, Omega Centauri is speculated to be the core of a dwarf galaxy that was disrupted and absorbed into the Milky Way. So how do you find Omega Centauri? As you can see, there are two main ways of finding it. The first one involves tracing the stars Hadar and Epsilon Centauri, which point towards the cluster. The second one traces the right and top star of the Southern Cross, which point towards the cluster as well. So here's a quick summary of what I've covered today. Star clusters are groups of stars that are gravitationally bound. They can be classified into two main groups, open and globular clusters. They are useful in astronomical research, and some of the common star clusters you can observe in Australia include Pleiades, Jewel Box Cluster, and the Omega Centauri. And lastly, I hope you found at least one thing that's interesting about these objects, and I strongly encourage you guys to join the Star Clusters gang. With that, I've come to the end of my talk. Any questions? Okay, since there are no questions yet, um, I'll just talk about some um, things that we can observe currently at this time in Australia. So the first thing I would like to introduce you is um, the southern part of the sky, which involves, um, which includes um, Crux, the Southern Cross, Centaurus, Carina, Vela, and, um, and some of the other constellations shown in this picture over here. So as you can see, this is based on um, the Stellarium app, which is one of my favorite software. And um, if you notice, the time below is actually, it, um, it shows what the sky looks like at about 7.30 p.m. Okay, sorry, we have a question uh, over here. So can star clusters be mistaken for small galaxies that are really far away? Um, so the thing about galaxies is that usually they have a certain kind of feature. It's like they have a spiral, they, they are sometimes spirals, they are lenticular, they are elliptical. And usually star clusters can only be observed um, for nearby galaxies. So that means if you look at like far away objects, like you look at distant galaxies, most of the time they won't be star clusters because the stars are too faint or they are too far away to be resolved. So um, there, there might be a chance that, it, um, that you could mistake uh, star clusters for small galaxies, but it's usually um, pretty obvious. Okay, so what makes the sky blue? Okay, so this was a point that I mentioned previously um, uh, regarding the uh, Pleiades or the reflection nebula. So the reason why the sky is blue is because, as you know, the light is comprised of uh, many different wavelengths, right? You have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, wait, sorry, <laughs> yeah, so all these clusters, all these colors, sorry, and so the thing about blue is that because it's the shortest wavelength of light, and um, based on this thing called Rayleigh scattering, only the, the shortest wavelength of light gets scattered the most as compared to um, the longer wavelengths such as green, orange, or red. So that is the reason why blue is, um, blue is seen um, very strongly because it's scattered by the atmosphere, by, by the air molecules in, in um, the Earth's atmosphere. And yeah, that is why the sky is blue. See, so, which kind of cluster, which kind of star cluster do you like the most? Wow, okay, I think uh, it's pretty obvious. I, I really like the Omega Centauri because of the fact that it has a lot of star and it really is one of the most prominent star clusters that you can observe in the night sky. So all you need to do is just, even a small pair of binoculars, 
you can actually see that fuzzy ball of, of, um, uh, of, of the nature of the star cluster. And just knowing that it contains like 10 million stars, it's, it's really amazing. Yes, okay. So how can we find them if you do not know where they are? Oh, um, so going back to the, the introduction, like the definition of star clusters. So they are actually uh, defined by an obvious concentration of um, stars um, relative to the surrounding background. So it's actually pretty easy to find star clusters because of the fact that imagine it's, if you want to find one star or a few, a few stars in a, in a field, it's pretty hard. But if you have a group of them clumped together, you, would, um, you can, you can um, think of it as like combining the brightness into a smaller, into a, a concentrated area, which makes it easier to spot. So I would say that star clusters are relatively easy to find in our Milky Way at least. Okay. Did Hubble telescope lead to many discoveries? Um, <laughs> I'm sure, yes, yes, Hubble telescope definitely did uh, make a lot of discoveries, but I don't think they, they made a lot of uh, discoveries pertaining to star clusters because um, Hubble telescope, one of the main features of, of the Hubble telescope is actually to probe um, deep, very deep sky objects. That means um, looking at um, other, other galaxies and other very faint galaxies. So usually you don't get um, these, um, the Hubble telescope will not actually find star clusters in, in other galaxies because as mentioned earlier, um, star clusters, to, to be able to resolve star clusters in, in uh, external galaxies is really, really hard and because they are so far away. So um, I think there, there were other telescopes which um, studied like star clusters in our Milky Way, but not, um, not so much for the Hubble Space Telescope. So what is the difference between open and globular clusters? Um, yep, so I think the main difference, of, are, like as I mentioned, there are, there are three main differences. So the first difference is obviously the number. So open clusters have fewer stars, globular clusters have many stars. And open clusters tend to be young, tend to be younger, whereas global clusters tend to be older. And um, open clusters tend to be found in the arms of the disk of the galaxy. That means if you imagine, if you imagine a galaxy as a, a pizza, a full pizza, open clusters will be located in, in the pizza itself, whereas for globular clusters will be located around the pizza. Okay, do other galaxies have star clusters? Definitely. Um, so Previously, I, I mentioned that it's really hard to observe star clusters in, in other galaxies, but for nearby galaxies such as the Andromeda galaxy or the large and small Magellanic clouds, you can observe um, star clusters in them, even though it's, it's, um, it requires more um, observing, um, it requires a, a longer observation time to actually capture the detail of these clusters. Um, so we, we do know that most galaxies or all galaxies should have star clusters. Yeah. Right. How many black holes are there in the universe? <laughs> um, this is a tough one. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not sure about this. But I must say that almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center. So a supermassive black hole is like a one gigantic black hole which sucks all the stars and gas inside. But obviously, it, it doesn't do it in one shot. It sort of goes in a spiral. It forms, it forms a disk. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Is it true that the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us? Yes, it is. So if you, if you know, um, most of the galaxies are actually moving away from us. And this is because of the, um, the expansion of the universe. And that is why a lot of things are actually moving away. And this is called red shift. But surprisingly, or, or quite expectantly, um, expectedly, astron Andromeda galaxy is actually moving towards us because it's pretty close to the Milky Way. And therefore, the Milky Way is able to exert some um, gravitational influence on the Andromeda, Andromeda galaxy. Okay, how far apart do they need to be to stop being a cluster? Oh yeah, so you mentioned that you thought that Pleiades was a constellation and you didn't realize it was an actual cluster. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that star clusters are groups of stars that are gravitationally bound. So when the stars do not um, orbit around the common center of mass, do not orbit around, are not like clustered or, um, or 
around each other, they would not be considered um, star clusters. And in terms of its actual spacing, in terms of the, the distance, um, I, I can't really give a, 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 an accurate answer to you because um, sometimes, that if you think about it, if you have big stars, you, the, the stars can be quite far, far apart and they are still gravitationally bound. But if they are, if they are small stars, that means these stars have to be closer together to be gravitationally bound. So it, it, it sort of, it varies, yeah. What are the subsets of different colors? Um, I'm not sure whether I understand this question um, correctly, but let me just go to the diagram which shows the Hertzsprung-Russell's diagram. Okay, so it's over here. Yes, so with, if you look at, it, look at it, uh, the diagram, um, stars are comprised uh, of many different colors. You have blue stars, which are hotter stars, and, all the way, and it goes all the way to red stars, which are cooler stars. So um, the thing about this spectrum is that within each color, um, you have like, as you can see, there is O, B, A, F, G, K, M. But within each letter, there is also like O1, O2, O3, all the way to O9. And it goes to B1 to B9. So there are subsets within each color. Yeah. All right. Can a supernova possibly destroy a star cluster? Yes, it can. And surprisingly, actually, um, most star clusters, I would say, as most open clusters, actually, um, they are, their lifetimes are pretty short because, um, as, as you can see, they are, they are much further uh, spaced apart. And therefore, if they have like certain um, gravitational, some um, gravitational like, perturbations from, let's say, like supernova or even uh, massive objects or massive objects coming close to the star cluster, it will actually disperse and, and cease to become a, a cluster. Yeah. How does Omega Centauri compare to 47 to Kenny? And are they similar in size and age? All right. Uh, I think from what I know, 47 to Kenny is not as big, but it still contains lots of stars because it's, it's also a globular cluster, just like Omega Centauri. Um, yes, it's, I would say they are similar in size and age. They, will, they are probably at least uh, 10 billion years old. Yep. Okay, the next question. Um, does that mean that star clusters are star clusters, not galaxies? Okay, yes, most of the time star clusters are not galaxies. The only exception I would say is Omega Centauri. Um, the only example I can think of because Omega Centauri was actually speculated to be a, rem a remain, um, a remnant of a dwarf galaxy that was actually destroyed by, by the Milky Way. So as you can see, the Milky Way is actually a, a cannibal in terms of stars. Um, but yes, most of the time, star clusters are distinct from, from galaxies. Yep. So the next question is, are many clusters grouped together, close together physically, or do they appear, do, do they only appear close? Um, yes, yeah, so clusters, to be considered a star cluster, you need to be, it, the stars need to be gravitationally bound. So if you see a group of stars, like one, one night, if you see a group of stars that seem close, you can't actually confirm if it's actually a, a star cluster un, unless you observe their, their motion. Unless you observe like how are they moving or, uh, yeah, if you, if you observe their kinematic data, that means you see whether they are actually orbiting around the center of mass. So. I must actually um, correct myself actually, like when, when I looked at the, when I introduced star clusters to you guys in the beginning, I said that it's an obvious concentration. So obviously this is not super accurate because obviously some stars can be clumped together or grouped close together, but they're actually not um, considered star clusters. So what the, the proper definition is that you need to actually look at the, um, the kinematic um, information about individual stars in the star cluster to actually properly define to it to be a star cluster. Okay, the next question is why is the universe a disk? Um, okay, so I don't think the universe is a disk. Um, I would say that the universe is, is um, the, the shape of the universe is actually, it's, it's quite, um, it's still like debatable, but um, it's definitely not a disk because if you think about it, um, all the things in, in the universe are actually expanding. So you don't, you don't actually get a, a disk like what, what you would see at like a galaxy, unless you're talking about galaxies. Then I would say that galaxies are, are, are shaped like a disk because of its 
um, angular momentum because of its conservation of angular momentum. So the next question is why are hot stars blue and not red? Yes. So um, this one has actually got to do with something a bit more complicated and it's, um, it's got to do with this law called Planck's law. So um, let me just go to the slide. Yes. So if you think about it, if um, so they, what, what they found in like a few hundred years ago is that for hotter objects, uh, they tend to emit light, they, they, they emit more radiation, of course, but not just that, they also emit radiation that is closer to, that, that is shorter in wavelength as compared to a cooler object. And that is the reason why hotter objects are considered, uh, they, they look bluish in color, like hotter stars, whereas for cooler stars, like um, they will appear uh, reddish. Yeah. Okay. What's the coolest thing you have learned about the nature or history of the universe from studying star clusters? Oh, what a big question. Um, okay. I would say that um, actually like for my honours that uh, because I'm, I'm currently a PhD student, but last year I also looked at, um, during my honours project, I also looked at uh, star clusters. And one thing I found it amazing is that because Global star clusters, especially global clusters, these clusters are very tightly bound. And because these clusters they are so old, they, they are like 10 billion years or even older. So what, what I found out, or, or what, what um, the study was, um, was about was that I, I was actually looking at these clusters and seeing how it traces um, um, the galactic interaction. So between the large Magellanic clouds and large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud. So, Star clusters, like I said, it's not just pretty balls of stars, but they, they can actually be used to determine very interesting things about um, things that are much bigger than themselves, which are like galaxies. So that's one of the cool things that I've, I've learned. Okay. Can a star cluster orbit another star cluster? Yes, it can. I'm not, so there is one object which I'm aware of, which is called the um, double cluster in Perseus, in the constellation Perseus, but, I'm not sure if it's actually a physical, like a, they are actually gravitationally bound or they, or they just look like two clusters very close to each other. So I, I have to, to check it out, yeah. Okay, thanks for all your questions, guys. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm really, oh, I didn't expect to receive so many questions on, on, on this view. Um, can planets orbit stars in a star cluster? Yes, it can. But I would say that um, usually uh, these planets um, would be a bit, they are, in terms of their orbits, they would be a bit unstable because they are always prone to having uh, being affected by the gravitational influence of other stars. So in terms of it being habitable for life, I, I wouldn't say that uh, these stars are, or these planets are found in um, star clusters are actually, uh, they, they have a very high chance of, of um, containing life. Yep. Okay, the next question is, uh, is it established that black holes are behind the formation of galaxies? Especially since ages are similar. Oh, okay. So especially since their ages are similar and black holes are located at the center. So this is a very interesting problem. It's like a chicken and egg um, problem. So which came first, right? So some people thought that it was um, um, black holes that, that led to um, the formation of the galaxies or that or and some people thought that it was the formation of galaxies that led to um, black holes so um, there isn't there isn't a uh, I can't really answer this because I'm, I'm not very familiar with this field but um, I would say I would, my, my guess is that it's uh, it's that galaxies themselves which form black holes first yeah is there anything about star clusters that totally blew your mind? Um, I think I mentioned it like a few questions before, like talking about how um, clusters can actually allow us to study like the interaction between two um, galaxies. Yeah. Are there elements still being made in the universe? Yes, yes, they are. Um, so actually elements are things, in terms of, in terms of the, 
um, the formation of different elements, you have many different processes. So in the form, in during the Big Bang, um, he, hydrogen, helium, and lithium was formed, but most of the other um, elements were formed in stars themselves. So there are definitely like elements being formed like right now because of how the uh, temperature and pressure of the of the star actually compresses and forces um, um, nuclei and, and atoms together so that they, they will form like new elements. Yeah. Can the sun orbit a sun? Uh, are you, I, I'm guessing you're referring to a star, right? Uh, can a star orbit another star? Yes, they can. And that is, and they are called double, uh, double stars. Right. Okay. Um, next question. What is the universe expanding into? Hmm. Do you think that there are other dimensions? Well, this is a, this is a tricky question. <laughs> so, it, 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 always, it is always thought that um, when the universe is expanding, it's actually expanding into uh, an empty space. But um, because the universe, it's, it's not like just a simple three-dimensional um, object. It's actually more than that. It's like four dimensionals or, or even more. So um, when, when, you say the, when I say the universe is expanding, it's actually um, expanding into nothing in that sense yeah i know it's really hard like i i can't even I, I there is no good analogy to actually explain this but um you you can't think of it as like a balloon expanding into the surrounding air yeah even though a balloon is actually used a lot in in um the universe expansion analogies yeah um do you think that there are other dimensions i think so like if you're talking about like other than three dimensions definitely there there is um i, I believe there is this there is a space time I'm um, not sure if there is actually a, a dimension higher than that. Um, I, I know it has been proposed a lot in a lot of theories, and even if you watch, if you watch um, movies like Interstellar, um, they will also talk about like the fifth dimension and things like that. But currently, from what I know, I, I think that there are four dimensions. Will the sun explode? Okay, the sun will not explode because of its mass. The mass is not too. Um, it's, it, the mass is not large enough. Um, so only massive stars which are more than eight solar masses, that means eight times the mass of the sun, will actually explode into a supernova. So what is the, the end stage of our, of our sun, you might ask? In five billion years time, it will actually um, puff out its outer layers of gas. In a very peaceful manner, it, would, it wouldn't explode and it will form this thing called a planetary nebula. Yeah. Okay, um, I will just answer two more questions and then uh, we, will, we will wrap it up. So the second last question is, how many star clusters are there in the Milky Way? Um, I'm not too sure, but I think it's about 100 plus. You know, maybe if, if you consider global clusters and open clusters, I think there is about, yeah, there's a few hundred plus um, clusters in the Milky Way. Okay, and the last one is, um, would love to hear a little bit about your PhD topic. Uh, yeah, so I just started my PhD um, a few months ago, and I'm actually looking at the Magellanic Clouds, which are the two uh, nearby um, interacting um, dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way. And I'm just seeing, I'm just actually investigating some of the chemical abundances of the Magellanic Clouds to, to try to understand more about its um, evolution and history. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for all your questions and uh, so sorry about the um, technical difficulties that, that, that we faced earlier, but I hope that you guys actually learned something about um, star clusters today. Right, thank you so much and uh, see you again. Bye.